on this episode of Postcards. Very fulfilling to put instruments in the hands of students and then go to a concert and see them playing them. And so art's been this thing that has, it's transformed me. Making a bracelet is far more complex than the actual finished product appears. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalomhillfarm.org. Live wide open a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. Well, I'm Del Sarlet. Uh, my wife, Carlene, and I own Sarlet's Music in Morris. The store has been here since 1953, so we are continuing the family tradition. My parents started it back in those days, and we continue to operate it to this day. Sarlet's Music opened in 1953, run by my parents, Walt and Florence Sarlet. My dad had been a band director for a number of years prior to that at a couple small schools in South Dakota and then came to Morris to be the band director here in 1942. He also had a reputation for a well-known musician. I played saxophone and clarinet in a variety of dance bands and stuff, so he was very highly regarded in, in, in that respect too. My mom had grown up in Milan. Her parents had a, a hardware store and she grew up in the store and then uh, went to college and learned and became a teacher. And she taught economics, accounting business classes in a few area schools. And my parents met when they were both teaching at the Morris School in the early 50s and uh, decided to make a career change in 53 and open a music store. So they uh, rented a, a spot in, on a side street in Morris and a little hole in the wall store on 6th Street in downtown Morris and opened up the music store at that time. My dad did a little bit of uh, instrument repair, things that he had picked up while he had been teaching, and then also did a lot of piano tuning. So he was uh, the area piano tuner for a number of years as well. In 1954, so the year after my parents uh, started the store, they went to the music, National Music Convention in Chicago. While there, they uh, went to a club and, and met with Louis Armstrong. It was kind of humorous uh, in that uh, my dad and mom and, and Louis were, were, were standing there uh, and Louis hands my mother his trumpet and says, here, you hold this, I'll take the money. And he grabbed her purse and he hung onto the purse. So that's the photo with my mom and dad, her holding Louis's trumpet and Louis holding my mom's purse. <laughs> that was kind of humorous. Exactly 30 years later, in 1984, Carlene and I went to the same music convention, national music convention in Chicago. At that time, the, the best known trumpet player in, in, the, in the business was Maynard Ferguson. I talked to Maynard a little bit and I said, you know, 30 years ago, my parents were in Chicago, posed with Louis Armstrong, and this is a photo. Uh, is there any way that we can pose for a photo with you? And, and uh, he said, sure, I'll do that. Anyway, so that was kind of an amusing thing where we had the exact 30 year span in between the operators of the store posing with the best known trumpet players of the day. And at one time in the early 60s, it was a Sunday morning and stores weren't open, but there was a uh, older gentleman that had just bought a brand new Buick and was not used to the pedals and the uh, other configurations of the car. And he tried to get it started from a parking spot on Main Street and he jumped the curb and piled right into the front of our store. So took out the display window in the front door and uh, 
Uh, that was kind of hectic for a few days. We had to board the place up and, 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 and get that done. But nobody got hurt. Uh, but he damaged his car quite a bit and one other car on his way across the sidewalk. My, my parents ran the music store then uh, until my dad passed away in 1978. So he was in the store until that time. Both my uh, older sisters and myself and my younger brother kind of grew up in the store. We all started working in the store, clerking and doing uh, odds and ends of things here. Uh, I think we all started probably in our junior high years and, and, and worked all the way through school. When the store looked like it was going to be sold, I moved away for a couple of years. I had gone to school at University of Minnesota Morris here, uh, majoring in economics and minoring in music with probably the intention of eventually taking over the store. But then when the time came, um, I didn't really want to do that. I had gone to also to a tech school in Sioux City to learn an instrument repair. So I was pretty well uh, suited to, to run a music business, but uh, the way things were going, I didn't want to do it at that time. The uh, sale for the store fell through, and then while I was in Illinois uh, working for a store down there, I met my wife, Carlene, and we married and uh, moved back up here in 1981 and took over the store from my mother and my younger brother who had been helping her run it at that time. So Carlene and I have been in the store ever since then. We've had a series of part-time employees over the years, uh, mostly music students at, at the local college at UMM or recent grads that were music students at UMM. And then about 10 years ago, we were fortunate enough to have uh, our current employee, Mike Odello, move in from California, and he's been working with us ever since. Basically, it's the three of us that keep things going. We came to Charlotte's Music and he needed a hand. And I said, I'll be that hand. And here we are. I do instrument repair and I call on area schools. I have service routes where I call on about two dozen schools a week. I go out uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays and, and uh, call on about uh, two dozen schools and pick up and deliver repair work. And my wife stays behind in the store and does the clerking and bookkeeping. And we've been running it that way since 1981. We do a lot of things in the area, both with the university and with the local elementary school, where uh, on occasion, uh, either Mike and I or Mike by himself have, have done demonstrations for local elementary students on different musical instruments, uh, what sounds they make, and things like that. We've done both those. We do a lot of things with the university, too. There's two different things that we've done over the years in that uh, for a long time, we've done instrument repair clinics for the music ed majors, where uh, we have a little session and demonstrate how to diagnose and do minor repairs on different instruments so that it can prepare them for their careers as band directors so they know what they're getting into a little bit and can maybe you know, solve some problems that uh, don't have to be sent into a shop or something for a, a brief yeah. amount of time. <laughs> okay. Thanks, you guys. You're awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to go home. Not only is it a retail business and, and provides us with an income, but we're also keeping students in music, helping them to learn instruments, keep them playing, and develop musical skills that will help them later in life. So that's kind of a uh, beneficial part of it too, that's, that's very uh, helpful. Well, music and the arts is very important in the area schools because it uh, helps the students develop parts of their mind that aren't really uh, covered by uh, more core classes like social studies and English and that the arts and music especially expand certain aspects of, of a developing mind and uh, band and choir teach teamwork with students uh, without the chance of getting hurt like playing football or hockey. Those are very important to the development of the students and a uh, music store is important at our area music store, a local music store is very important to keeping those things uh, provided to the area schools. There aren't too many mom and pop music stores around anymore so we're getting to be kind of a, a diminishing breed here. As far as running the business is concerned, very fulfilling to put instruments in the hands of students and then go to a concert and see them playing them or to repair the instruments and keep them playing where a kid will be really frustrated with an instrument that's not working and will do whatever repairs are necessary to, to make it functional again and then see the look on the kid's face when the instrument actually plays well. And, and uh, that, that's very, very fulfilling. It's got its rewards. Can you tell me the joke about uh, the 
the trombone player in the playground. Can you tell me that? Sure. How do you tell which children at the playground are the offspring of trombone players? How can you tell them? They're the ones that uh, can't swing and don't know how to use the slide. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Lindsay Walls and I started an organization called Courageous Hearts back in 2013. Hearts is an organization that's really designed around creating a space for young people in particular, mostly um, middle and high schoolers, to really find a space to express themselves and to find their creative voice but also find their voice in the world, right? So finding your voice through creativity and art can be a really powerful experience. To have a space where you can hang out and create and maybe find your inner artist or just have a space to build community with one another is really what Courageous Hearts is all about. Courageous Hearts offers a few different opportunities for young people. One of them is open studio during open studio. Sometimes there's really elaborate projects that happen over the course of many visits and sometimes it's somebody just kind of doodling and really there's just like a conversation that's happening about the world or high school or whatever is the most relevant thing at the moment and so open studio is a really fun and kind of I always describe it kind of like a choose your own adventure space so young people really decide how to be in our space. We don't have a lot of rules we actually have very few rules other than like clean up after yourself. We kind of treat it like a Starbucks where everyone walks into a Starbucks and kind of knows what the, the rules are even if they're not posted and I think that young people aren't always given as much credit as they deserve in terms of knowing how to do, how to do the world and giving them that space to feel some ownership. I grew up in Lake Lillian, Minnesota, and it's a tiny little town in West Central Minnesota, and I didn't really realize how much this little town impacted me until a few years ago, and I, was, I came back after being in the city for a long time and just really found so much value in the community that exists here and the ways that people step up and help each other out. And I think Courageous Hearts has been very much influenced by that sense of community and wanting to create that same kind of interconnection and interdependence among people in the big city of Minneapolis. On August 1st, 2007, it was a Wednesday and I worked at a group home for youth and so my shift was often, some days it was in the morning, some days it was in the evening. That particular day I had a day shift. I left work about 5.30, kind of took my normal route. Traffic came to a complete stop basically. And I got kind of frustrated at some point and I thought, okay, maybe I'll try to get off on the exit right before the bridge. I was in the left lane, kind of figured, Oh, so much work. I'll just stick with it. It'll probably be just as quick as driving through downtown. I got to basically the middle of the span of bridge and that's when I heard a beam snap. I don't know, it sounded like something dropped. Within a millisecond, my car was doing a nosedive. I just kind of gripped my steering wheel and waited for impact. All of the water came up through the engine and in through the, the filtration system and up into the cabin of my car at the exact same rate that it was going into the water. So by the time my car stopped moving, I was drowning. My only hope, well, the only thing I thought might be possible is that like some windows had broken during the fall. Nothing did, I had to get myself out. I kept pushing, kept pushing, and at some point my, my body started to gasp for air. <gasps> I've started to understand that I've actually, I gulped. Whatever protected me from drowning was I swallowed the water instead of inhaled it. And that happened three, four, five times. I knew this is it, this is the end. When you're waiting to die, you get all these images of 
how pop culture says you die. And I experienced a flash of light and I was like, okay, that's step one, I don't know. <laughs> and then I started to feel like I was floating. And at first I thought, okay, well that's step two. I'm dead now. But I didn't feel dead. And I also didn't feel trapped in the way that I'd been trapped. But all of a sudden I was free. The Interstate 35 bridge has collapsed. Trucks are submerged underneath the collapsed Dozens, part of not more people inside those cars. It was uh, heavily traveled at that time. That was during the bus hour. Uh, steel girders gave way somehow. We have no idea what kind of numbers we're talking about. Our ongoing live coverage of this major disaster in Minneapolis here in just a moment. I had to swim about 15 feet from where my car was to climb up onto the island of Bridge. I ended up having a broken back. I had to stay in the hospital for five days. I had to wear a back brace for about five months. And, and then I just also had really serious PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorders, where I was in, you know, nonstop recovery mode and trying to function like a quote-unquote normal person. I came home from the hospital after that happened with a broken back and a broken spirit in a lot of ways. and. I happened to read in a community education flyer, there was a class called Soul Painting, and the description basically said, you know, just let yourself, your, let your soul out. You don't have to be good at it. It's not about technical skill or anything like that. It's just about painting. And I was immediately drawn to that. It sounded like exactly what I needed. And so art's been, this thing that has, it's transformed me. It's the thing that I can step into at any given moment and find out something about myself, rediscover a part of who I am, or just like tell a different story. I think over the years of painting, I've potentially gotten a little bit better at it, but that's not what it's about for me. I'm not painting to like put them on my walls, though sometimes I do. I'm painting to explore the depths of who I am. I think that's a really profound thing to offer to other people. I think we live in a world where creativity becomes inaccessible to too many people. And I think everyone needs to know that they have a right to be creative and that there are thousands of ways to show up and be a creative person and that it can be so nourishing to who you are as a person. I've been interested in the folk arts since the mid to late 70s and 80s. My husband, he and I and our two children lived in Norway for a year while he was in graduate school. And um, it was during that time that I had um, what I would call an awakening to the breadth of the folk arts of Norway and especially of that part of Norway. We went to northern Sweden for a festival, a reindeer festival. The little town is called Jokmot, and it's north of the Arctic Circle. The festival has taken place the first weekend in February for centuries, and it was during that festival that I really became aware of the Sami jewelry tradition. And 
It's a folk art. So they used, of course, things that were available to them, namely reindeer leather, reindeer antler, and the spun pewter cord is very traditional. The materials go back centuries. The bracelet tradition itself, that really took hold once the tourists started to arrive in, in north of the Arctic Circle, in the, maybe in the 1940s. Tourists always want to buy something, and so they started the bracelet tradition. The Sami people are a, a minority indigenous people in countries of Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and the Kola Peninsula of Russia. The Sami people have been, like in many countries, and not singling out Sweden and Norway and, and Finland, but in many countries the indigenous population has undergone a lot of governmentally sanctioned laws that, that have harmed them, and, and the Sami are no different. In the late 70s, there was a river project called Alta in northern Norway to create a hydroelectric dam and it would have taken out a village as well. There was a lot of opposition to this, but even with all of the opposition, the hydroelectric dam was constructed and the village was lost. Ultimately, there was an awakening of the importance of the Sami culture uh, the Sami parliament was given far more say into what actually went on in that part of Norway, rather than having Oslo dictate reindeer herd sizes, uh, that became much more localized among the Sami people. So even though they, they lost that battle, they really made strides socioeconomically and politically after that, after the Ulta project. This week in Milan, I am teaching two classes here at the Milan Village Art School. I start everybody off on a traditional three-strand braid bracelet. I will go step by step and tell them how to, how to construct a bracelet. They're learning a new technique, and the success that they have with learning a new technique is exhilarating. They come away with a piece of very wearable jewelry that initially looks, they think it looks like a mess and they won't be successful and that last stitch pulls it all together and all of a sudden people are just wowed by what they are able to do. And that's, as a teacher, it's really, it's a, it's a thrill for me every time at the, at the end of the class to have people so happy with their project. Making a bracelet is far more complex than the actual finished product appears. Initially, I have every student measure their wrist, and from that measurement, we cut a strip of reindeer leather. Then they take the strands of the pewter thread, and they braid this in a certain way. The pewter braid that they've created is then sewn on with invisible sort of fish line, very lightweight, uh, invisible thread. So they have this, the leather strip, the pewter braid, which they have now sewn on, and then they tuck the ends of that, they make little slits into both ends, they tuck the raw edges in, and then they have to make their, their loop for their button. Anybody who ever wears any kind of jewelry, uh, other than a ring, with a bracelet, the clasp is everything. If the clasp isn't sturdy, if the clasp doesn't fit, you will never wear it. And so having that tailored to each wrist is very important. After the uh, button is sewn on, the leather loop is made and sewn on, then they sew up the back and trim that last stitch 
and without incident, hopefully, one time I had the last stitch, somebody, in her excitement, she clipped the last stitch and cut the bracelet in half. <laughs> so we try, I always, I always say, you know, be careful with the last stitch. That, in a nutshell, are the, those are the steps. It takes about 30 seconds to tell how you make it, and it takes uh, several hours to actually complete the task. Milan Village Arts School is a gem. The students that come back and take classes from me, I've gotten to know a lot of them. They are returning students. I feel like I've made really good friends here. And I think Milan is transformed and so fortunate to have the Milan Village Arts School. And I, I just can't speak highly enough of this school and hope that people recognize its, the importance in this community. <laughs> I learn a lot from students that I have and after every class if I've learned something new I try to incorporate that into my next class. I've had classes where the youngest has been maybe 10 up to uh, quite an elderly man. And it's been, it's been to my benefit. I'm so happy to have been able to, to, have, to add this part to my professional life as well. I'm very interested in the arts, and I've always done something personally, but the teaching of the bracelet classes has brought really uh, an enormous amount of pleasure to my life. And it's, it's helped me learn more about the Sami, the indigenous Sami people from which this tradition springs as well. So the, the importance of indigenous cultures, we benefit from that. We benefit from recognizing the art, not only the, the visual arts, but the you know, music, um, theater, all of those things. I think we're all enriched by preserving traditional cultural arts and experiences. Visit pioneer.org slash postcards to catch up on missed episodes and to find out more about your favorite segments. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in west central Minnesota. More at LiveWideOpen.com. Alexandria, Minnesota a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at ExploreAlex.com.